Well, welcome to our <laughs> webinar, uh, Remote Sensing Applications. Um, thank you to our both speakers, uh, Dr. Wilma Slanka <clears throat> and Dr. Betsabe de la Barrera Bautista. I'm just going to introduce our uh, briefly our uh, two speakers. Uh, Will is a remote sensing scientist, recently working as the remote sensing specialist for the Landwise project with the University of Reading. His research focuses on estimation and analysis of relative surface of moisture observations using C-band satellite radar bus cutter data for natural flood management research. And also he uses the optical Sentinel-2 data for crop identification and verification purposes. His PhD focuses on the observation and later modeling of passive microwave radiation from the natural snowpack at multiple, multiple frequencies. Observation took place during an uh, eight month field campaign and it was split over two periods, uh, two winter periods. And this was conducted uh, at the Finnish Meteor Meteorological Institute Arctic Research Center in Finland. Our second speaker, Betsabe, it's an uh, earth observation scientist using GIS and statistics for understanding the, the environment. Her main research interests are four. Uh, first one, to improve understanding of how vegetation responds to climatological events by exploring remote sensed data. Uh, the second one is uh, monitoring these changes through time. The third one is to understand how ecosystem productivity is linked to uh, environmental conditions. And finally, assessing vegetation conditions and land cover change. She's currently working as a research fellow in the Integrate Climate Resilience Understanding the LEAST project, uh, analyzing the impact of climate change into natural vegetation, agriculture, and livelihoods in this country. Betsabe is also involved in different projects monitoring environmental impacts and changing changes with uh, earth observation data, including permafrost degradation. And finally, I'm just going to uh, present our early career uh, representative of the GI division, Dr. Mesjin Rasol. He is a postdoctoral research fellow at the Gustav uh, Eiffel uh, University. Um, uh, he is going to be a moderator of this uh, webinar, and myself, Veronica escobar which I work as a research support scientist at the University of Reading. Well, thank you so much for joining us, and now I will uh, allow Will to share his screen. Um, I am uh, Will Maslanka. I am going to be presenting some work that I've done with the, in conjunction with the University of Reading on the Landwise project. And specifically, I'm going to be talking about my work on calculating relative surface soil moisture across the Thames Valley using Sentinel-1. And I'm going to be going through from data acquisition up to verification of the relative surface soil moisture uh, product. So a brief outline of the presentation. I'm going to give a very brief introduction to the Landwise project as a whole, its project motivations and where I sat within the project. I'm then going to talk about the method in which to calculate relative surface soil moisture. So this is whenever I mention RSSM, I talk about relative surface soil moisture. And I'm going to be talking through the processing workflow that I've got to get to that point. And then I'm going to follow on by talking about some verification of the of the product. So I'm actually going to be using talking about two separate independent data sources that I've used to verify the RSSM product. So the Landwise project, as with every kind of academic um, Products or academic uh, projects, they often have uh, long acronyms with interesting names that they've managed to throw all the letters in together. So LAMWAI stands for the Land Management in Lowland Catchments for Integrated Flood Risk Reduction. And basically, the project is aiming to evaluate and assess the effectiveness of realistic and scalable land-based natural flood management measures, so or NFM measures, um, aiming looking at groundwater fed lowland catchments. So in our instance, we're looking for the River Thames in the UK. Um, the reason that we're looking for this is that within the measurements of and within the research studies of NFM, 
a lot of work has gone into looking at uh, leaky barriers and leaky dams and a lot of in-channel techniques and in-channel measures, but not a lot of work has actually gone in towards land-based measures. So this project is having a look to try and assess and get evidence behind the land-based measures so that we can begin to have them as evidence and we can include them in flood mitigation schemes. Uh, as with many big, uh, um, with many academic projects, lots of different work packages and work pillars. Um, Landwise is made up of five. We've got one that's generating local knowledge. So this is talking about talking to the farmers, talking to landowners, talking to policymakers, and those that really know the land in their areas, um, as they're the experts in their field. If you excuse the pun. Uh, we then got another work package on field observations. So this is with the UK Centre of Ecology and Hydrology, where they have been taking soil samples from hundreds of fields across the Thames catchment and getting loads of soil properties. Um, I sit within the third work uh, pillar, which is the remote sensing. And I've been looking at, as I'm going to be talking about, getting data from satellites um, for remote sensing purposes. Um, all of that data then gets fed to our modelers who have been then doing a lot of the work, taking that in-situ data, taking the remote sensing data and the local knowledge and modeling different types of NFM measures on different catchments. That data and those results then get fed to our web app development team who have been then basically giving new ways to show the results so that we're able to feed those back to the landowners and the farmers and policymakers and show them the results from our research to hope that we're able to actually give them information that they would actually use. So the study area and the data that um, we were, have been looking at. So our study area is the Thames Valley in the UK. And for those that are unfamiliar with the um, with the catchment, <clears throat> excuse me, it's the red polygon that's on the map on the right hand side, and it can be summarised as the non-tidal part of the River Thames. Um, very uh, basically and broadly, it's much more rural to the west, much more urban to the east, and you have a lot more rolling hills over in the kind of rural west area. And the, uh, the Thames itself flows west to east from those rural areas through then into the increasingly urban parts of the likes of Reading and Windsor and London. Uh, the data myself that I've used um, has been the centre to one uh, constellation, and I've been using level one infrared wide um, ground range detect high resolution data at the vertical vertical polarisation. Um, and I've been collecting data and I've been using data between October 2015 and September 2021. So there's a nice six year time period of six water years that I've been able to actually have a look at the hydrological cycle across the catchment. Um, and I've been looking at the two ascending orbits, so orbits uh, 30 and orbits 132. Um, you can see from the map on the right hand side that the catchment sits quite nicely in between those two catchments. So I'm able to use both of those ascending orbits to have a good catchment and a good idea of getting a good um, reliable data source. Um, I've only been looking at the ascending orbits um, primarily due to data management constraints and to data storage constraints and for processing time because if we're using both ascending and descending orbits, while it does double our number of available orbits and available scans, it does put our data um, processing up to, and our data storage up to about three and a half terabytes, which would take a long time for us to be processing. So this is why I've been only focusing on the ascending orbits to so bringing it down to about 1.7 terabytes. Um, but a little bit going into the nitty gritty of how I've kind of gone through this work. Um, hopefully, um, you may have come across these before if you've been looking and trying to get with satellites remote sensing data, but there are multiple different ways of actually accessing and downloading the data. The two that I looked at for this work uh, primarily has been the open access hub of Copernicus, which is the image on the top. Um, and that's the main hub for using Sentinel data. And that's one of their main storage and downloading centers and APIs for the Sentinel data. But you can also use the Alaska, the NASA Alaska satellite facility, which is the image on the bottom. Um, both of them have got uh, very good user interfaces, as you can see from the images, and have API capabilities. Um, personally, I've used the Alaska satellite facility because I found the downloading and acquisition a little bit more user friendly, but the Copernicus one is perfectly fine. Um, alternatively, if you didn't want to be downloading terabytes of data to go and actually be using it, and you just want to have a look at actually what the data, what the actual satellite imagery is looking like, and then you can use that within Google Earth Engine. Um, that's, that is a really good piece of um, kit. Um, personally, I needed to actually play, bring the data down and have a look and play with it. So I was using uh, the Alaska satellite facility to actually download the data and make the data itself. Now, unfortunately, because I'm downloading the data in its level one format, you can't actually just use the format or the data as it is. Um, 
especially for calculating relative surface soil moisture, it needs to be processed and you need to actually remove some of the error, uh, some of the artifacts and some errors that are in within the data just from um, observation um, techniques. Um, so this needs to be go through a processing pipeline. Um, so this kind of pipeline or workflow, I'm going to split just into three separate aspects just to kind of keep it simple. I've got one that I've called pre-processing, which is going to involve a lot of the nitty gritty uh, orbits calibrate or the orbit corrections, calibrations, those sorts of things. I've got a part that I've called manipulation and normalization. And this is where I'm actually subsetting and cropping the data to the area that I'm looking for. And then doing a little bit of um, ang uh, instant angle normalization, which I'll get into in a bit more detail. And then once I've done that, I'm actually able to get into this RSSM calculation and actually get a relative surface soil moisture time series. Now, the processing, there's lots of different steps to it. Um, however, very helpfully, there's been other people that have actually already done this and have gone through and have got a published workplace. So I've been following a layout that's been proposed by Fifoni in 2019. Um, there's a citation at the bottom that kind of goes through it in more detail, but the very basic steps and workflow processes and the kind of order is shown in the flowchart on the right hand side. Um, this removes a lot of the geometric distortions, so you can get rid of any um, slight variations in orbit, you can get rid of a lot of issues that come up with the um, border noise, you can get up, get along with some of the stuff that is involved with the terrain correction that is involved when you're looking, um, especially if you're looking at quite a to, uh, topography complex areas. Luckily, the Thames isn't that complex in its terrain. However, it's able to remove some of the artifacts from that. Um, and in order to do that, um, there's a couple of different things that you can use. However, I would re highly recommend using the ESA Sentinel Applications Platform or SNAP um, program, um, as this is something that has been purpose built to use with Sentinel data. Um, again, it has a really good uh, user interface, so it's really easy. It almost works like a GIS platform, so almost like QGIS, but it actually has a lot of the stuff in the background. Um, it also, because it's been purpose built, it also has a lot of the orbit, uh, the um, pre-processing steps already inbuilt as purpose-built tools. So here I've got the um, very easy calibration thing where you're able just to read in some data, run it through a calibration command, and then write the data out. But it, because it's able to have them as individual steps, you can build them into work and create workflow pipelines. So rather than having to do this all manually, you're actually able to write it up as a bash script. So this is kind of where bash scripting and using high power computing is actually really uh, important as it takes a fair bit of time to chug through a lot of data, but it also allows you to set something off and let it go overnight for a couple of days for a week. And that way it allows you to get on with other work while it is working in the background. Now, the reason why it's really good is in so you can get on with the background is because say in my instance where I have six, six years worth of data, you looking at two orbits, there's a lot of data that's there. So as I mentioned before, I've got 100 and, um, uh, 1,164 raw tiles, um, which would be the um, data that comes across. There is any uh, data that has been observed over the catchment area from those two orbits. Um, in some instances, the, the catchment sits across two tiles, so they need to be stitched together and then cropped. Um, in some instances, they it sits smack bang in the middle of one tile, so it doesn't need to be stitched. Um, so there requires a little bit of um, data manipulation just to get the line up everything correctly. Um, I've done that through MATLAB. You could do that through many other different things. Python is a perfectly good, um, would be perfectly fine to do this. I personally have used MATLAB just because that's my area of expertise. Um, but you're able to stitch these the tiles together and then do a bit of a visual check just to make sure that everything has worked properly and then remove any er uh, erroneous like tiles or scenes because there has been some uh, data that has been corrupted but hasn't been picked up in the bash scripting. So in my instance, I had uh, one, uh, as I said, I had this part of uh, 1100 raw tiles stitched together gave me about 640 scenes and then going through and doing a visual uh, check, there was a best part of about 30 scenes that had error in his data. So I've removed those out and it gave me a total of 608 valid scenes. So these would be for, an, for a given day, the orbit has given me some data. So a little bit now in, in the specifics about radar backscatter. Um, in the instance of the soil moisture observation, it's kind of backscatter is uh, reliant and dependent on three separate properties. You have soil moisture, you have surface roughness, and then you have the interval, the look-in distance angle. Now, 
the soil moisture is the variant of the dependent that we're after, the one that we actually want to know. Uh, the surface roughness, we can assume to be constant throughout the year because of the scale that we're looking at across an entire catchment. The actual, any slight variations in surface roughness actually gets worked out and, and um, can be removed by spatial averaging. So we can ignore that. Whereas the, oh, we can neglect that, sorry. Whereas the look angle, uh, the look instance angle actually needs to be removed and we need to count, uh, counter that. And this can be done through normalization. So I have the kind of normalization equation here um, where very briefly, we've got a normalized backscatter at a given reference angle. So this would be an angle that we would want to ref, uh, normalize the angle, uh, the, the backscatter to. Um, you have the actual backscatter. So this is the one that has gone through the processing and the, uh, the manipulation and the cropping. And then you have the normalization parameter, which is how we're able to actually adapt the um, backscatter. And for this study, we've used a reference angle of 40 degrees, as it's quite common in the literature, and it would seem to be quite easy just to stick it to 40 degrees and work with it from there. Now, within backscatter normalization in literature, there are two ways to calculate annual backscatter or annual beta. You have a simple way, which is just a direct linear relationship between the instance angle and backscatter. So this is called uh, beta D um, or uh, the direct normalization. And you have a complex way, and this uses a multiple regression relationship. So this is where it has beta R or the uh, regression normalization. Now, part of my work is I've actually investigated an, investig an extension to this. And rather than just looking at annual normalization factors, I've had a look to see if there are monthly variations. And you can see from the image on the, uh, the graph on the right hand side, from the uh, pale red and pale uh, blue um, curves, that actually there is an annual, a slight annual curve, which we believed it to, be, uh, to be part of a um, kind of some impacts from vegetation. And when we have implemented this, rather than implementing the annual backscatter, we've seen that there has been some improvements to uh, RSSM calculations when we've compared them to in-situ data sets. And I had a paper that was published earlier this year that kind of goes into this into a lot more detail. So if you want to have a read of that, please feel free. Um, and then you'd be happy to hear final uh, equation. Um, we can actually get into the calculation of RSSM. So this is where we've taken our normalized backscatter and we compare any given pixel to the rest of the pixels in that time series. And we can look at them at the largest and smallest backscatter values, assuming they correspond to the wettest and driest um, soil moisture values, um, which we've seen. In, this is a, a pretty valid assumption. Um, so it's a and it's a well documented um, model. We actually don't use the largest and smallest values, but we use a statistical model to remove outliers. Um, the citation at the bottom goes through this in a lot more detail um, and is a really good paper into looking at how this RSSM calculation actually works. So I would highly recommend giving that a read as well. But basically, it, this the equation, we have our RSSM value on the left hand side, and it's just an index between normalized backscatter and these wet and dry thresholds, or these largest and smallest backscatter values. So that is all of my equations. I can actually now go into map, and actually go and talk about what the, that data actually look like. So here I'm showing normalized backscatter for the 11th of September in 2018. And you can see that there's in this there kind of central uh, middle part of the catchment, you've got this nice high or higher backscatter value uh, return compared to lower backscatter values to the north and the south of it. You'll also see that there's some kind of almost splodges of data that has been masked out. And these are urban areas that I've removed and freshwater areas that I've removed from the analysis, just because it doesn't actually hold any soil moisture value uh, any soil moisture data within that signal. So I've just masked it for, for ease and for um, necessity. So we would take this backscatter data. We then compare it to the dry threshold. As you can see here, this is a dry threshold that's been calculated across the entire six years uh, time series and a wet threshold. And when we run it through the equation, it gives us an image like this. This is then showing the kind of central swath where we had lower backscatter or uh, higher backscatter, sorry, showing it as we've actually got quite a large or quite a high RSSM value swath in the middle compared to two drier areas. So once we've, I've gone through this and done this calculation and done this, created this time series, verification is quite key to see if this is valid, this, this is true. We start with the spatial verification. So again, the image on the back we've got is the RSSM values for that 11th of September in 2018. And superimposed on top is two hourly um, animation of the two hourly data from the UK Met Office, and it's their rainfall rate, it's their precipitation intensity uh, data for the two hours preceding the orbit. And we can see that it actually, it spatially lines up fantastically, that this kind of central swath really highlights or is caused 
because there has I mean it's, it's pretty, um, pretty obvious when you look at it but it is of course because there's rainfall over the previous two year uh, two hours so it means that because there's been rainfall over the two hours that top a couple of centimeters of soil is really wet so that shows it's why the soil moisture has really increased whereas the areas where it hasn't rained is really dry because there is no precipitation so i've done this study for a, a number of different uh, orbits a number of different observations and it the spatial uh, parameterization the spatial uh, distribution of the rainfall and the rssm values lines up really nicely so looking at it spatially we're now going to look at it temporally we're going to have a look and actually see Four given points, have a look and see how that varies with time. Um, so for this, I've used the UK Centre of Ecology and Hydrology Cosmic Rain Network. So it's the Cosmos UK uh, network, and they've got sensors up and down the country, but they have a number of them across within the Thames catchment. So I'm looking here at Chimney Meadows is one of the um, one of those um, in situ sensors. Um, and that measures volumetric water content over the top 15 centimetres. So well, I've top the top 15 centimetres of the soil. So what I've done for this is I've normalised that so that I'm able to compare a relative observation with a relative observation. I've applied a, <coughs> excuse me, applied a moving average over that time series so I can remove some of the noise and then compared to a, a um, temporal analysis. So you've got the, on the left, you've got the comparison between the cosmic ray sensor, which is the black uh, trace, that's the VWCI, and then you've got the Sentinel-1 data, which is the RSSM is the red trace. And I've also included the uh, precipitation uh, totals for a given day at the, at the Chimney Meadows site using a Pluvia rain gauge. And you can see that actually, generally, there's quite good agreement. Um, and you can see that as well with the scatter plus on the right-hand side. That there is quite good agreement. Usually, well, the surface soil moisture and the volumetric water content are in agreement that it goes up over in the winter. Uh, goes down in the spring and then comes back up again in the autumn. There is an overestimation in the late summer, um, and this is quite clear, you can see in July 2018, and that's July, August time, um, where the volumetric water content decreases, whereas the RSSM value increases. Um, for those that are unfamiliar with the weather at the time in the UK in um, the summer of 2018, uh, this was during our period of time where we actually had no rainfall over the best part of about 35 days. So, this is where we've actually, uh, having a look at some of the data, looking at um, some videos of the site, some photos of the site, and having a look at NDVI and um, Sentinel-2 data to have a look at op uh, optical data. We actually think that this is due to vegetation growth. Um, and this is actually the, where the backscatter is becoming a contribution, having an additional contribution from the vegetation and from the surface soil moisture. And this is something that I am um, have a, uh, going into, and I've got a paper that I think I submitted last week that's looking into this in a bit more detail. Um, the Cosmic Ray Network, if you're interested in that, I have a um, citation at the bottom that is really good to have kind of a brief overview of what the data, what the network is and how it can be used for scientific data and scientific research. So it's, again, another one that I'd highly recommend reading. Um, so in summary, um, I've gone through kind of a brief introduction to Landwise, it's in the workings and where I sit. Um, I've gone through the calculation of this RSSM data set. I've gone through the data sources, the, where the, uh, the study area, kind of some of the pre-processing steps, how I've used them, how I've done them. Um, so the manipulation and normalization of the data, um, as well as the calculation, and gone through the verification steps with the in-situ data sets from the Met Office and from the UKCEH. Um, so with that, this is my last slide. So I would like to thank everybody for listening. And I think I'm gonna open it up for questions. I've seen that there's some, might be some on the chat. Um, Yeah, so if there's any, if you have any questions, please do, um, yeah, ask them now, I think. Thank you, Will, uh, for, for the, this nice uh, presentation and very interesting work, actually. Uh, I will uh, ask uh, audience and uh, panelists, uh, if you have any question, please uh, go ahead before we uh, listen a bit, a bit Sabi for her presentation. But Sabi, if you have a question, it will be a, is an open discussion. Eh? We can uh, really go ahead and discuss uh, ideas with Will because I have uh, already a question. Well, if no one I, have any, I questions, have. I, yeah, sorry. Go ahead, Bit Sabi. Go I ahead. I just please. wanted to check, like in your in your slide of the verification, would you over 
post the um, um, precipitation data, the animation yes. one. Oh, the animation yeah. one, certainly. Yeah, yeah so uh, just to understand, that is <clears throat> rainfall. Yes, so this is uh, from five minutes. The same time, kind of. Yes, as yes. in two so hours the, as well. Okay. Yeah, so the orbits um, for the ascending orbits for this area, they come across at about uh, 18 UTC. Um, so what I've done is I've taken the um, rainfall radar data across the UK and across the Thames catchment. I've taken it for the 24 hours previous. So I've gone from um, 18 UTC on the 10th of September across to 18 UTC on the 11th. And I've done some kind of spatial analysis of looking at when the, uh, how much rainfall falls in the area compared to this uh, kind of the spatial patterns and if they match. Um, so this kind of central swath uh, really is highlighted over rainfall that happens over the previous two hours. Um, you can see that there's a, to the northwest of the plot of this image, you can see that there's kind of like a higher, um, not quite a strong return, but there is still quite a higher RSSM value area compared to the areas to the south. So if I'm trying to think if I can roughly in this area to the um, northwest. Um, that area has actually had a uh, rainfall that's passed over in the three to four hours that's happened, and that rainfall has then since passed out of the catchment. So this is why there is rainfall, there is kind of still high RSSM values there, but not quite as high as where it has just rained. Um, yeah. So it's had a bit of time to sink in a little bit of evaporation, a little bit of infiltration, um, and it's removed a little bit of the um, soil moisture, that's kind of surface soil moisture from that time. And have you measured, just for curiosity, like what happened after the rain? As in like, how long does the sign out? So this is- Well, you the, can, yeah. It's, so yeah, we've, so. yeah, so I'm able, with this data, I'm able to have a look and see what it would be like tomorrow. One so day I can see what it is for one day after, so it's had a whole day to go through. Um, one thing that I've, I've not yet managed to have a look to see exactly how much, how would the rainfall of time as it would uh, progress. Um, that was something that, uh, as part of the project, we had hoped that we would be able to go out and do, um, but due to technical problems and with COVID restrictions, we weren't actually able to get out into the field to do a bunch of measurements. I know that Veronica has lost hours on building kit for um, some stuff for this project that hasn't actually, um, that we weren't able to use because of uh, restrictions. Mm. Um, but we were aiming to, yeah, it was something that we, we would like to do and something that I think would be a fantastic piece of future work to actually have a look and see how the infiltration rate would work in relation to the soil moisture observation. So we could see if it's rained six hours ago, can we determine, okay, well, that means then that we're going to have lost 20% of our relative surface soil moisture or something like that. We can get a, a direct relationship between the two. Yeah, we could see it would be really nice to see exactly yeah. how long does do you have the signal for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really cool. Thank you so much. It's really nice. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Will. Um, can I ask you just a question in the next slide? I think it was the next one. Yes. Do you think that error that you were mentioning in July is related to your um, normalized parameter in the RSSM? Or So we see this increase regardless of the normalization parameter that we use. So I've done this analysis. So you can see this one is for, it says up in the title of the um, the kind of busy line graph um, that is chimney memories regression monthly. So this is where I've been using the beta R, the monthly beta R. I've done this analysis with uh, annual monthly normalization factor, annual, uh, sorry, the simple annual, the simple monthly, the regression annual and the regression monthly. So I've done it with as a kind of a combination. Um, mm -hmm. And this is where we see that there's it, this, this kind of increase over the summer is prevalent in all of the data, um, yes. in, in all of, regardless of the normalization factor. Um, mm -hmm. There's actually in the literature and in with mm -hmm. other people that have done this work at a um, more coarse resolution. So this this data is done at a 100 meter um, spatial um, spatial averaging. I've done this also at 100 meter, 250 meter, 500 meter, and a kilometer grid resolution, which is the traditional one that's used for this method. Um, mm -hmm you see this uh, this overestimation over the summer in all of that data, and you see that it's, it's a documented thing that is something that is kind of like a um, cutting edge bit of trying to remove this um, vegetation index. And it's a, it is definitely because of vegetation growth over this time. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. And in some of the work that I've done um, recently, I've got different 
been looking at the soil moisture values for, or the soil moisture return or the backscatter return for different crop types um, across the Thames Valley. And there are a number of crop types that actually, due to the geometry of the fruit and the pods, mm. give a massive backscatter return because it massively increases the scattering um, in the kind of canopy layer. Um, so it's definitely this this increase is definitely due to a vegetation rather than a um, parameterization. Um, there, there is a slight discrepancy because the the cosmos uh, volumetric water content measures over the first say 15 centimeters and the surface soil moisture measures over the top two centimeters so there is a slight lag um, but we've kind of removed that in part with the um, moving average that I've applied across this the data so we can remove some of the noise and remove some of that discrepancy um, but yeah, we, we definitely think that the sort of this kind of increase over the summer is due to vegetation because it's something that you can see annually. Um, yeah. You see it in you can the, see the it roughness quite... of the the vegetation roughness. Uh, it's more. It's not so much as the roughness. It's more that the vegetation itself has an additional contribution. So it's then, okay. whereas we have over the winter when the vegetation isn't there, the contribution is is yeah. is solely from the ground. Over the it. summer, it is now a combination of the ground and the vegetation. And it's no. that extra vegetation contribution that is in causing that increase. Okay, okay. Well, thank you. Um, thank you a lot for this presentation. Very interesting. It's my pleasure. I, have... uh, I just put in the chat uh, your most recently paper, if someone wants to check it, which is related to this uh, presentation. Yes. Okay, well, thank I, you. Thank you a lot. I, I have a question, Veronique, before you uh, sure. move with uh, Beth Sabi. Well, thank you all for the for the work. Very interesting. Actually, what, uh, what interests me, it's... Um, uh the part that you're doing the the two different seasons like for example uh, dry and uh, with let's say rainy yep. but uh, what is uh, relevant to what i did before uh, in terms of uh, seasonal change of the water content which is polar channels uh i also used two different session uh, seasons like for example uh, during the summer and winter but not exactly during the rainy season after the rain, as Betsabi was discussing with you, uh, so the saturation is more uh, as you you can uh, know that. And, and now I can prove that that the situation in Barcelona at that time and what I see in your graph uh, for the chimney midway, so for the regression uh, during the January to April, you have uh, the the peak. Uh, period i guess it's yes. all the years yes which is interesting because i had uh, very similar but i was working with a uh, ground penetrating rider mm -hmm. uh, with around 30 meters with low frequency what here i have a question regarding uh, for example you were talking about box scattering yes so what uh, you already answered, Veronique, in terms of the combination of two reflections that happen, the vegetation and the soil uh, uh, characteristic, let's say. Mm -hmm. But in, in, in my case, I had the active and unactive uh, underground uh, streams, let's say, polo channels. In this work, you were only working on soil moisture or you were working on the water content also or you are planning to do something related to the water content to see the active uh palu channels or something like this with this uh what's so, you're doing? so this work we're aiming to have so th because i'm looking at the surface i'm only looking at the first the top two centimeters of the soil mm -hmm. um so anything below uh, your the, your ground penetrating radar is going to see a lot further into the ground than Sentinel well or Sentinel one well, um, so we're really looking at kind of that first that top couple of centimeters so that we can have a look and see how much we're, we're aiming to have this data so we have passed this on to our modelers so they have a um, quite a, lo a long time series of what the saw the that kind of top centimeters of uh, saw moisture is so we can have a look to see how that infiltrates mm -hmm. because we're aiming to have a look to see if we can through changing farming practices. Um, whether that be through changing crop cycles or changing um, crop management uh, schemes. So if this we going to be increased um, plowing, if increased um, traffic on soils, increasing or decreasing the compaction, if we can alter the infiltration and alter the, uh, the actual storage of water in the soils on, the, on these farms. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to then 
from that, and we, if we're looking at this is some stuff the modelers are currently doing and are in the process of running through their hectic models. Um, when we have these, this, um, when we have this rainfall that's passing through, we can then try and keep the water in the soil rather than keeping it from either sinking down into the kind of active channels, as you were saying, or running off into um, kind of the river network and the river courses, uh, the water courses themselves. Um, because this then, if we have a lot of, if we were to have somewhere that has got quite a lot of compaction and there's not a lot of infiltration that's going in, what that's going to do is just have a lot of water runoff. And that means we're going to have a lot of soil erosion. There's going to be a lot of pollutants that go, any fertilizers that have been put onto the soil. If it falls onto compacted land, that water and that uh, overland runoff is just going to wash that pollutants away into the water courses. So we then increase a lot of pollution. So that's kind of what we're ultimately hoping to do. And I'm this this kind of surface centimeter first a couple of centimeters of soil moisture data hopefully will then help to feed them feed the modelers with their anecdotal evidence and their anecdotal data so they can spin their models up so we can see okay we know what it has been let's see what happens in the future let's see what will happen okay thank you very <laughs> thank you very much um well should we now continue with betsaver but anyway uh, well, first, thank you for the invitation to the seminar, and uh, thank you, Will, for a great presentation. And I'm going to talk, so I'm Betsabe de la Barreda. Uh, I'm working with all these people in a, in a project in the Swedish Arctic, and also uh, it's part of another project that is working with Veronica and Keith in the Arctic as well. So... The title is the mapping of permafrost in the Navisco in the Swedish Arctic with Earth Obser observation data. So we know that the Arctic is warming rapidly, even like uh, faster than any other part on the on the globe. It, it is warming two or four times faster, which this is bringing lots of consequences. Um, so. One of these is the thawing of permafrost, which permafrost, I'm going to tell you a bit more about this, but it's a permanent frozen ground. And that creates subsidence in the ground and also the formation of thaw lakes. Uh, that also, like with this uh, subsidence, you have an increase of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And also it impacts the, the infrastructure of the of the that of everything that is above the permafrost, and this increase in, in greenhouse gas emissions has an, a strong positive climate feedback, resulting in greater rates of warming for the globe. So it, it is a quite important topic, and um, and this is just for you to know what is permafrost and what is the active layer that is that I'm going to talk about this all the time. So the active layer is that this layer that I show you here that so like it goes as in it goes each summer and it has a lot of biological activity. And the permafrost, which is let's say this like this this layer, which is the permanently frozen layer of the ground, and it contains a high carbon. So this permafrost is what we are trying to understand and what is happening and what re research is showing is that with the ground temperatures uh, increasing, then you have like a, a, a thaw, uh, like you, like, sorry, the thaw is great, greater during summer. So the active layer actually gets bigger. And in some areas, the permafrost is completely lost. Uh, on the other hand, the satellite data shows that, the, that there's an increase in on thaw lakes because you can measure lakes in the Arctic, and that indicates area that that areas where permafrost has been lost or decreased. And also, you can see a lot of increases in moisture in areas where permafrost is losing. Uh, there's a lot of like there are really scary. Uh, projections that the 30 to 70 percent of permafrost will be lost by 2100 how do you tell you 2100 so when it's so the idea is to 
to measure this through remote sensing, right? But like normally, like you cannot, like the, the traditional methods are field work methods and they cannot like cover the whole, the whole Arctic. Um, and, and you cannot quantify the rates and the extent of, perma, the, of permafrost thaw. Like, so what we are doing is understanding this thaw by subsidence using different methodologies that I'm gonna show you in a bit. And this, uh, these technologies are a combination of optical, uh, SAR and drone data. So I'm telling you this because, well, SAR is incredible useful in these areas because you don't have like the problems with clouds, but also it is really important the optical part because you need to find and understand what is happening with the vegetation there. And sometimes like, in this case, we are using drones to have a really high spatial resolution. So the objective is just, as I said, is measuring the subsidence, which is a vertical movement of the ground and, uh, and use vegetation changes as a, prox as a proxy of this thermoprost. And also we are trying to monitor uh, methane emissions as the consequences of this. So this is just to tell you about um, something really important to understand why the changes in vegetation are quite important for this area. So this is like more or less how it works in the Swedish Arctic. Uh, so you have balsa, which is like a raised wetland. And what it happens is when, when you have permafrost below and it's intact, you have a type of vegetation that normally is drier. When the, when the pulsa collapse is because the permafrost is losing. So you have a, uh, the, you have a decrease and it's this, this kind of thing that you see here. So you will have more uh, water on the surface and that will create a lot of like biology, bio, biological uh, processes that what we'll do is to start like changing the vegetation type, but also the moisture levels. So what you will have at the end is a much wetter vegetation and these pictures show like how more or less is the, 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 these transitions. And this is really important because this type of vegetation emits, I think we have found that it emits lots of methane. So just to show you where are we working is in the Swedish Arctic in three areas in, in the tourist station, Store Flaket and Store Dalen, which are like uh, wetlands in this area and this picture is how it looks in reality and I haven't gone because of COVID but like uh, the Swedish and actually Veronica went there. <laughs> um, so what we did again we used drones, optical images, historical orthophotos and Sentinel-1 in SAR and around the field data we used active layer depth uh, emissions, uh, methane emissions and land cover. So with that, we created land cover maps, DEMs, and we tried to understand these changes in the pulsars and understand it as well, the subsidence. So I'm gonna talk a bit more on the, on this. I'm, I'm dividing this into the different methodologies so that you can see. Uh, so first the orthophotos. So we managed to get orthopho historical orthophotos for the areas. These look like that. So you have an orthophoto here. I just put them like the main ones, the uh, 1960, 2008, and 2018. And this is just a zoom in of an area of a pulsar. So you can see that this area is the rice area, and this area is the one that it has collapsed. And this is just an example that how is retracting on time. And uh, this is another option. And this is how it looks in reality, a pulsar that it hasn't been, uh, well, like how the lateral collapsing is looking. And this is how it looks uh, after collapsing. Uh, then we use drones and we got uh, flights that were planned in the area. We had uh, flights in 2017, in 2020, and 21. 
We had on board the drone a multispectral camera and RGB as well. And, uh, and then with PIX4D software, which is a software that helps to kind of do all the like uh, auto rectifications and uh, create mosaics of all the images that you take in the drones. We use that to create then uh, our mosaics that were the ones that we used to, to do vegetation maps. With that, we use a supervised classification. In this case, was super vector machine. And then we also create uh, digital elev elevation models that to see the difference between the 2020 and 27. And 2021, we didn't because um, we just have for uh, 21 um, some of the data. Uh, so then we just INSAR, which INSAR, um, I think you all know what is INSAR, so I'm not gonna, uh, but what it, what it does is like, it allows you to, to measure changes in the land surface altitude. So what you do is you have a bunch of INSAR data that you layer all together, you stack and then you create something called interferograms that it will tell you how the ground is deformed from time one to time two. And uh, this, is, this, this is the way that we are doing. We are doing a, a technique that it, was, uh, that it was developed by Terra Motion, which is a company and a collaborator of us, uh, where they use uh, APSIS technique that also I can give you the reference for good papers of that if you want later on. And then we did the, the, in the field, we measured the active layer. So this is, um, this is literally, you take us like a, like stick, you, you like, uh, how do you say, like you make hole in the ground until you, uh, until you get the permafrost. And then you see how much is the active layer and how deep is the permafrost. So we did that, well, I didn't, but like my colleague did, and uh, it was during the summer. And the idea to do this, it was across different vegetation types so that we can see if there was any difference of different vegetation. Um, and now I'm gonna show you really fast what we have seen. I'm just conscious about the time, but like, um, so this is the orthophotos. So as I can, uh, as I've told you, we digitized the the palsa mire, like the edges of the palsa. It was digitized by three different people so that we can reduce the error because it's a completely visual interpretation. And in those areas where the where the difference between the three observers were uh, not bigger than fifty centimeters, I think. Uh, we took that those areas and then we measure how we're changing on time. So in these lines, you can see uh, 1960, 2002, 2008, and 2018. And you can see how uh, the red line is 2018 and the black line is to, uh, 1960. You can see how much the pulsa has been uh, shrinked. And what we did then is to have this uh, to have these rates of um, rates of shrinkage. So what we did is just to calculate the rate of the of of this collapsing, and then we have found that actually from two thousand two, like the collapse is much faster, which this is in. This we found this paper from from these two guys in 2016 that they found that the the temperatures in ground uh, ground temperatures were increasing faster from 2000 to 2012. So sorry for 2004 it started like growing faster. So then that that coincide exactly in that moment that we that we saw as well like a, like a rapid shrinkage of the pulses. Uh, now, what we've got with the orthophotos is a, 
like the, the land cover classifications. And as I've told you, these are the results. And uh, sorry, the images need to some scale and north uh, and other elements of the maps. But um, so I just wanted to show how they look, the maps. And um, it was just really interesting to see, for example, like all the permafrost lost, uh, which are in these three types of vegetation. And you can see that sedge wetland are these like, like really bright green. And these are all the areas where the pulse has actually collapsed. And if you have, if you take this image into your, I think, keep it on your mind because, and you see all these areas of, uh, of the yeah, bright green, that they are the areas where the permafrost has been lost. Uh, you can see in, a, in another image, but I will t I will tell you that. So what we found is like if we put these vegetation types and then we combine it with the active layer that I that I've told you that we measured, we we found that the raised pulse pulse vegetation types, which are the ones that are more intact, have a shallow uh, active layer which means that the permafrost is still higher. However, in the fen vegetation types, which are those areas that I've told you that are in the, in the surroundings of the palsa, you have a really uh, deep active layer, which means the permafrost is higher than 140 centimeters. So again, this is another, Another um, evidence that the permafrost in that areas are are like sinking. Um, and now these are the results from the from the drone data, the, the part of the digital elevation model. I'm just showing you how it looks the digital elevation model from the processing drone images, and you can see exactly where are the areas where are higher in the pulses and lower in the pulses. And then what we did is the difference between 2020 and 2017. And we found, and again, as I tell you to remember it, these areas are areas where they are shrinking and they, as in the, the, the pulses are collapsing and these are an indication of permafrost in this area. Uh, and finally, like the results, with the insert data. So we wanted to see like how actually the insert data will do it because we had like a really high spatial resolution. And this is with insert, which is as in, in the uh, drone data, you are talking about centimeters and the Sentinel one, you are talking about 20 meters by 20 meters pixel. So we were just checking what were the differences? And this is just to show you how it looks the, the insert data. And again, even the insert data is showing how the pulses are subsiding in, the, in this area. We found difference between the two methodologies, but it's obviously like this, the spatial scale that we are looking at are quite different. And, um, and in this case, we are, this is the average surface surface uh, motion in three years. And again, uh, we found that the 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 raised pulses are the ones that are subsiding uh, faster. So that indicates that the inside data and this data is telling you what is happening now, like a rate, like it's showing like. A, like a rapid change of permafrost in the area. Uh, and I promise this is the, from the final one. We just did the, the methane emissions and this was measured in June, 2021. And we just found that the areas where, where, that, uh, where the permafrost was lost, we are seeing more methane, methane concentration. So yeah, this is like the combination of all these methods is a great opportunity to, to monitor permafrost. Uh, you can have a panarctic approach. You can detect 
rapid changes and uh, because this is really important to measure millimeters of this because permafrost is losing all over the place in different ways and different rates and uh, all this data gives you the opportunity to combine and understand better the subsidence and yeah, yeah this is really important because yeah it is affecting people livelihoods global warming and we need just to take action and to understand better and to create better policies to conserve these areas and i think that's all for me thank you so much thank you so much that's very interesting um the Tavet presentation was uh, related to her uh, recent paper and i just put it in the chat if someone wants to check this paper is very interesting um, if someone has any questions, um, please do it. <laughs> uh, I do have a question. If you compare in terms of the extension of the degradation of the permafrost between the INSAR and the drone, did you see that the INSAR actually uh, overestimate this permafrost uh, degradation or uh, over or underestimated? Yeah, that's a good question because we found that like INSAR was, uh, yeah, I would say overestimating uh, some areas. However, and this is something that we need to understand, we don't know if it's actually overestimating or the drone is underestimating it. Uh, because what we, what we found is like in all that areas that are like, uh, in the Myers that are, let me just show you a, how do I go back? Sorry, just want to show you the, uh, the picture of the, where are they? So in these areas, like the INSAR is detecting a lot of um, subsidence. And the drone doesn't, but these areas like uh, like Sophie went there, and it, and she says that you can see like a like that it was it is collapsing, and it is collapsing, and it is like a quite recent collapsing. So what we are thinking is that maybe also like um, Insar is telling us like maybe a rapid change that you cannot that you cannot actually detect with drone data. And also so because you have all the time series at the end. And also with the drone, you use a different technology, LiDAR, it's true, no? Then more probably, no? We didn't use LiDAR, which that's a problem because we just use the DMs from the flight, which brings a lot of error as well. Exactly. Because yeah. obviously you have all the artifacts from like, yeah, wind and all the external kind of uh, things that you have to deal with. Um, obviously you try to do as equal as possible one flight to the other one. But there are, I think that's something also really interesting that you have, I think it shows those differences but the error is bigger in the drone data than in inside data. Mm, okay, that's very interesting. It's very good to know. Um, yeah. Uh, and it would be money. really, sorry, it would be really interesting actually to use LiDAR and to see that, but the production is like LiDAR in different times as well. And that's really difficult to That's get. another project. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, anyone has another question uh, to Betsabe? No. Um, well, I think we are a little bit over time, then I am just going to end the webinar. Thank you so much for uh, both speakers presentation. And I'm just going to stay to record the first part. And I hope it does goes well. But just free, uh, feel free to go if you have any plans or you can stay for it's just five minutes of the recording. Uh, but yeah, thank you so much for participating in this webinar. Um, Jean, do you have something to say? Uh, actually, Veronique, maybe you can do the first part for recording. Uh, that will be good. Well, uh, I thank you uh, all of you. First of all, uh, actually, for organization of this webinar, Veronica, it was a big effort. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Will. Thank you, Vitsabi, for very interesting uh, presentations and uh, work you are doing. I, I wish very good luck with your work. Uh, and uh, I hope you can find some uh, collaboration work, all of us, uh, to do some stuff uh, together in, in, in future. And uh, thank you again.